If you are watching via the live stream, please use the chat box for any questions that you might have for the moderator and or the panelists. The chat box is being monitored and questions will be asked on a first come first serve basis. Thank you. And for our panel session, the moderator will be A.J. Malsha. Uh, he is the R. Eugene and Susie E. Goodson Distinguished Professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue. He has over 25 years, actually over 27 years of academic scholarship in areas including human-centric convergent manufacturing, bio-inspired designs, multifunctional materials, and system integration. Uh, with applications in heavy-duty machines, heterogeneous microelectronics, smart food manufacturing for equity and in-space manufacturing. And I know that he's going to try to bug me later about technology involvement. Um, he says that it's enough. I need to tell you that he's a, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, fellow of the American Society of Materials, and the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. And then I'll stop and introduce our moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barrett. Well, welcome all in this beautiful atrium. If you compare this place with any, any other place, you remember we have a capsule here, so we are different. Everybody's smiling and cheerful. I don't know whether it is because of the end of the semester or the panel is going to be so exciting. I think it is about the panel. So thank you again for that. I have a very exciting opportunity to talk to my colleagues, very distinguished set of colleagues, and especially our guest here. So with that, I would like to start the introductions. I'm going to be flipping pages here to go across. So if you hear a little bit of noise, forgive me for that. But our chief guest today is, I'm going to pronounce your name right. I must tell you, because names are important, and I would like to pronounce it right. So, I speak loud enough. Latin is it, right? Close enough. Close enough. Thank you. <laughs> so, our chief guest is one of the world experts in corrosion science. And he has extensive accomplishment that Dr. Barrett would extensively introduce him later before his uh, discussion and talk. But in the interest of time, I would like to point out some of his accomplishments at MIT. Uh, he was the, at the MIT for quite extensive amount of time as the director of Olin Corrosion Laboratory in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, corrosion is one of the areas that touches literally every material, so his field touches everything between every machine that we can imagine. So it has a very deep footprint. He led the School of Engineering of Materials Processing Center at MIT as its director from 1985 to 91. He's now an emeritus professor of MIT. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also the fellow, fellow of ASM, American Society for Materials International, and of NACHE International. He is also founder of Altran, Materials Engineering Corporation. I'm going to hold some information behind in the interest of my colleagues so he can introduce you. Our second panelist is Dr. Barrett Caldwell. He is the professor of industrial engineering and astronautics and aeronautics by courtesy at Purdue. His PhD from University of California, Davis in 1990 is in social psychology and Bachelor of Science degree in aeronautics and astronautics and humanities at MIT in 1985. His areas of interest and expertise to him and his team are examines and improves how people get, share and use information as well in settings including aviation, critical incident response, healthcare and space flight operations. He has over 200 scientific publications in journals and conference publications. He's extensively involved in the relation to the academies of sciences, engineering, and medicine, including one of the very organizational and leadership role at Frontiers of Engineering 
which is some very key events that NAE looks forward for that. Also, he, in, from 2016 to 17, he was a Jefferson Science Fellow at the U.S. Department of State, and also he's a director and principal investigator of NASA-funded Indiana Space Grant Consortium. He's a fellow of Human Factors and Ergonomics Society and the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineering. He has been involved and Purdue has tremendously benefited from his leadership on the task force for equity and uh, equal opportunity for all students of all identities. Thank you very much for your service. In addition to our distinguished colleagues that I introduced, we had two other colleagues. Professor Sang, he is a Ellenfeld head and distinguished professor of chemical engineering at Purdue, where he is engaged in a rational computer-aided drug discovery research. He earned simultaneously Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in chemical engineering from Caltech, and his PhD from Princeton started his career at University of Wisconsin, Madison, rising to the rank of Wisconsin Distinguished Professor in eight years. In 1997, Dr. Kim left academia for a big pharma as vice president of R&D IT, first for Werner, Lambert, and then Eli Lilly. He returned to academia six years later as distinguished professor at Purdue and to serve from 2004 to 2005 at NSF as division director of cyber inf infrastructure. Dr. Kim is a fellow of two engineering societies, AICHE and AIMBE and was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2001. Welcome, Dr. Kim. And then, last but not the least important, we have Sasha Bolteseva. She is Ron Darty Garvin Tonjan Professor at Electrical and Computers Engineering with courtesy appointment in materials engineering at Purdue. She received her doctorate degree in electrical engineering at Technical University Denmark DTU in 2004. Sasha specializes in nanophotonics, quantum photonics, nanofabrication, and optical materials. She has received, in 2013, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, Photonics Society, Young Investigator Award, 2013, MRS, that is Materials Research Society's Outstanding Young, Young Investigator Award, and 2011, MIT Technology Review Top Young Investigator Award, called TR35. 2009, Young Research Award in Advanced Optical Technologies and from the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany. And the Young Elite Researcher Award from Danish Council of Independent Research. So she's one of the global colleagues that we have that one can imagine. Among her multiple accomplishments, she is the Fellow of National Academy of Inventors, of National Fellow of MRS, IEEE, Optica, which used to be called OSA, Optical Society, for America, uh, of Optical Society of America, and International Society for Optical Engineers, SPIE. She served on the MRS Board of Directors, and also she's one of the most highly cited researchers in the web of science in 2020 and 2021. So you can imagine that we have between world-class nanotechnologies and optical engineer, a chemical engineer with the tremendous expertise in IT, your field touches literally every discipline. And then you can continue all the way to the space. I mean, you can just imagine that how much breadth and the depth of scholarship we have. So on the screen that you will find out that I had just made a really humble attempt to set up some stage for this conversation. But really, I would like to invite my colleagues here to think about, before we look, what would be the next 50 years it is always important that we stand on the shoulders of giant. We look at what was accomplished in the last 50 years. And there are a lot accomplished that we can feel excited about as engineers, scientists, thinkers, uh, socially conscious colleagues. But if you look at these accomplishments, this is not my list. I must admit that quickly. This is from Popular Mechanics. So this is by the people vote you would find out there are many things that, that has transformed our life. But if I, if I see where we stand today in 2020, I see a very interesting picture. If you see in the hindsight, if we look at the Maslow's pyramid of human needs, really the first part or so far, our inventions touched how we can make human life better. But it was more inspired, driven, 
all the way from ideation, invention, innovation, and implementation as human. Now we just came to the point in history that human brain is just not enough for ideation. We need, need to take the benefit of digital life forms of ours. They sometimes call avatars, they sometimes call, it can be used as AI. But now we are at a very important point in our, our own history that we will have our partners in the digital world to ideate, invent, innovate, and implement. This is very exciting, but a very scary time, I must say that. And that might reflect how old I am. But with that intent, I have a list of questions that I will be going through. But I will just keep those to myself for time being, not to bias you. So with that intent, my first question to all my colleagues here is I will kick off by saying, one of, out of all these range of inventions that I was thinking that what is one invention that connects many other inventions and innovation? And the word that quickly came to my mind is semiconductors. Semiconductor powers everything from wireless to World Wide Web and avatars that I just talked about to AI. So semiconductors and silicon are the two words that connect, connects at least 25% what was in those inventions, and that is pretty powerful for the last 50 years. So my first question really goes to all of you, and I'll take my seat in the course of conversation. And I will start with our main guest, and the order that we will pursue in the, in the future after the first round is really we'll start with our colleague, who is my reflection on the other side, but much better, smarter, and, and otherwise than me. But we'll start with you, and we'll come back here. Does that make sense, order-wise? If you do like to chime in between, feel free to do that as colleagues. But first question I would like to start with you, Ron. That how do you see in the next 50 years, do you think we will either evolve, revolutionize, or disrupt the word semiconductor? Question one and part two of that question, will silicon be still material of now, or there will be truly a material of future? Go ahead, Ron. Well, <laughs> those are those are interesting questions. Let, let me just take a step back, and I will answer them, um, or give you my thoughts on what you should say. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank everyone for being here. I'm particularly and happy to be here myself. You know, this is actually the third attempt at holding this meeting. Uh, and of course, COVID-inflicted delays have made it just about impossible. But I'm always reminded of the baseball phrase that three strikes and you're out. So I figured if, if I didn't show up this time, I probably would not be invited back. So I am, I am distinctly honored to be here today. And I'm, I'm especially pleased to be surrounded by this panel um, of distinguished scholars and researchers and, and an audience of smiling faces. This is, uh, how, how, how can you get any better than that? Um, now, before I answer your question, I, I think it's a very relevant question, but I, w I just want to tell you how we came to the thought of having a discussion around the question of where will engineering be in 50 years? What is engineering 2070 going to look like? Will there be silicon semiconductors? Will there be others? We'll, we'll come back to that. The, the basis of this conversation is related to a publication of the Nas National Academy of Engineering which I edit. So this is a plug for the academy, I guess. But it's, it's called The Bridge. It, it turns out that The Bridge began publication 50 years ago. So I thought it would be very interesting to have 50 members of the academy write essays, on their, given their specialties, on where they saw their field 50 years forward, so 2070. And, you know, one of the interesting recurring themes in this issue, and I, I, think, uh, I think you have an electronic copy which is available. I think that's correct. Have you guys seen this? No. Yes? Some have. I can, I can guarantee you that Maria somewhere has an electronic copy which I think is available. But one of the recurring themes in all of the writing in this issue is the concept that the evolution of new engineering systems, whatever will emerge in the next 50 years, the evolution of those systems involve risk, right? There are technical risks, 
there are economic risks and there are social risks. In a technical sense, you know, you may be developing a technology in your laboratory that works perfectly well, but there's always the question of whether or not you can scale it up to industrial size, whether that means for an individual consumer or for a manufacturer or whatever it happens to be. So there's always a technical risk. Can you scale it up to be useful? And then, of course, there's an economic risk. What are the costs? Will it be affordable by either individuals or by companies? Will investors emerge who are interested in providing the resources to develop the technology so that it becomes marketable? Those are risks. Yeah, you know, if the answers are no, you're in trouble. But it is the third risk that is, I think, most underappreciated and probably uh, least practiced in the, in the technology world. And that is the societal question, the so societal risk. And I'll, t I'll give you an example of what, what I mean by that. If you think about the internet and the World Wide Web, I don't think when, you know, when Tim Berners-Lee developed the, the web, his idea was that it would be a platform that would provide technology and information all over the planet, all over the globe. And frankly, the web does a beautiful job of that. I, I, I would imagine everybody in this room has interfaced with the internet and the web today multiple times, and it, it's just part of our lives. So it performs what Tim Berners-Lee intended beautifully. But there is another dimension. The web has begun to serve as a source of disinformation. It has served as a means for cyber attacks of one nation against other nations. It has served as a vehicle for recruiting malcontents who wish to create harm all over the world. I know that Tim Berners-Lee never intended that. Uh, but I think it, it's a demonstration of the fact that um, the internet, and particularly social media, which is a consequence, is a, it operates without regulation. And I think that's the case either because the people who are developing these technologies see a marketable product and revenues which are significant. There are very wealthy people who have been beneficiaries of this. But the fact of the matter is they are not serving a useful social purpose. And so I think one of the things that we must do, we collectively, technologists, is that we must start thinking more deeply about the kinds of controls and, and filters we put on the technology that we develop and that we introduce into the marketplace. That's not easy, but I think it's incumbent on us as the developers of the technology to, to accept responsibility and accountability and act. And we don't do that very well. Now, one final comment. The bridge, I look at this as not just a volume, it's a bridge to public engagement. Because of the nature of the articles in here, the, the, the public can read this and understand it. This is not intended to be a document meant only for uh, the experts in the field. This is a document that is readable. And I think it's important because it'll give context to the general public that is very much needed in terms of the way we respond to the introduction of new, new technological systems into our lives. You know, we, we, we have a right and, a, and a, actually a, a responsibility to act on these things. And so my hope is that this volume will serve that purpose. I'll, I'll tell you that in Winchester, Massachusetts, which is where I live, we have used this volume uh, as a guide to discussions that we have a, a technology forum that we've established in town. And there are, there are doctors and lawyers and uh, retread MIT engineers and plumbers and, you know, a lot, people who are not scientists but are interested in, in technology and concerned about it, who get together twice a month and we have, I, I think, absolutely heartwarming discussions. Seriously, it's exhilarating because the, the community is talking about science and technology in ways that I find really, really exciting. So uh, this is a bridge to technology and public uh, involvement, which I think is really quite important. Now, to semiconductors. Can I just say a word about semiconductors? You want to go through the panel. <laughs> I've taken too much. No, time. I appreciate actually you introduced the bridge because 
socially responsible engineering is going to be one of the founding stones of the next 50 years. I hope it has to be other for just the survival yeah. of the humanity. So I'm glad you kicked this conversation with that message. Yeah. But please, I would love to hear uh, your thought process, whether we will call it a semiconductor or this would be something else. Well, you know, you, you folks, some of you folks may have heard of what's called the Material Genome Initiative. It's, it's an initi initiative that was begun during the Obama presidency, uh, the uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, rolled out a program called the Material Genome Initiative. And the whole idea is to say, if, as we evolve, if we need materials that don't exist today, that have certain properties that are needed in order for a new technology to be introduced, let's develop a computationally derived design and implementation strategy to develop those materials. It will be quicker, cost effective, and it will be immediately deployable. It has all the right attributes. And so I have this, I have this uh, dream that someday a president of the United States will walk up to a microphone and say, I am committing this country, and I'll come to semiconductors, I'm committing this country let's say, to a hydrogen economy. And in order for that to, to take place, we need to have semiconductor photoelectrodes that will split water using sunlight as a source of energy. And I call on the, uh, the Materials Genome Initiative to develop that material. And, and I will also point out, this is the president speaking, that sunlight and water are both free today. Today. They know no geopolitical boundaries. They're available to the legacy nations and to the non-legacy nations. The whole planet will benefit. But we need a durable, cheap semiconductor photoelectrode. Can you help me, MGI, in developing it? And I then hope that a representative of the Materials Genome Initiative will step up to a, microscope and say, a microphone and say, Madam President, we will find that material. Now, I hope you caught that, because I said that for all the, I have four granddaughters. And, I, and I, really, I, re, I really mean that, though. I really hope that somewhere we will both make use of this material genome initiative, but also that we'll have a woman president before too long. That's personal politics, but we can leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. I think well, let's start with materials genome project. That is a great start. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Sasha, go ahead. We're happy to share as, as a you. nanophotonics expert yes. your thoughts. Well, first of all, I'm very privileged and honored to be here and to be part of this panel. And I just want to um, set the stage for what I'm going to say and um, announce uh, that I am a believer. I am a believer in good, in human uh, nature, and I'm a believer in much better future for everyone. And I think, as you pointed out already, that we, that's going to be a cornerstone to develop conscious engineering with, um, with a better well-being for everyone and the planet in mind. Um, and now going back to semiconductors, um, and obviously um, I'm doing photonics, um, and I'm doing quantum photonics. Um, and I might be biased, but I don't think it's a bias. It's a future. Um, I do believe uh, that uh, it's not a coincidence that we started with the bridge, because I believe in bridging together multiple disciplines, people, scientists, and public, and everything. And I do believe that what we are witnessing today, and uh, namely major technology and science revolutions and quantum and big data and AI, we have to bridge them and merge them together um, in order to develop something which would be very disruptive. The future, in my view, is going to be hybrid, that will be integrating many pieces together. We already see that um, on inner supercomputer. 
we already have optical links that are much faster, as we know. And uh, one of my colleagues and my dear husband, he used to say, uh, you know, the best electronics is photonics because it's faster, and you're never going to beat the speed of um, the speed of light. Um, and in the information technologies, we are here uh, leveraging the fact that um, nanoscale electronics and optical fibers that are bigger size are working together. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be the future. We have optical links and optical detectors already in our supercomputers. And the next stage is going to be quantum. We are reaching the limit. We are reaching the size of a single atom. We are utilizing the quantum effects. Um, whether it's going to be a single platform, I don't think so. And frankly, I don't think that we have to stick to the well-established semiconductor foundry because we will not be able to continue the disruptive growth. And it's well accepted now among all the companies doing quantum, and you wouldn't believe it, but it's like um, it's a couple of hundreds of companies um, in this country only that position themselves as doing quantum. And you would think of a giants like IBM and Microsoft, but there are tons of companies you wouldn't think are doing quantum that are really investing in R&D and quantum science. And they are betting on the very different platforms because it will be so that for specific applications, you are going to use and leverage different technologies. If it's a sensor with unprecedented sensitivity, um, the platform would be quantum optics that will be using um, this uh, entangled photons coupled together that um, due to quantum correlation can actually provide you with this unprecedented sensibility. Um, and for other things like supercomputing, we are going to use a different platform, maybe new topological quantum materials, for example. Um, so I do believe that it's going to be hybrid and we will have to work um, very hard in bridging different disciplines together and different platforms. And with that, I will pass it on. Thank you. So uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I should mention that in my abbreviated biosketch, I left out the fact that almost 40 years ago, I actually worked for Intel. Uh, <laughs> and at the time, Intel was still very much in the mode of a, and the culture of a startup company because it was barely a decade after uh, the company had been, a decade and a half after the company had been founded. Uh, very different from the world of semiconductors today. Um, and, and so I still have a, a lot of ideas and insights and thoughts that were uh, planted from that experience uh, in the 1980s. Um, but also wanted to touch upon the theme of the uh, special lecture today, which is about the future of energy and future of engineering. So if you kind of step back and look at the big picture and take out the politics and just look at the science and technology question of our energy uh, uh, assets and energy portfolio, the way to look at it is uh, we have this wealth of high density energy, which took millions of years in geological time scale to form. And it's ultimately solar energy that was concentrated across these millions of years, and now in the flash of a pan, and literally on a geological time scale, in an instant, we are in a, in a situation or we're in a position to utilize all that energy to have this tremendous burst of creativity over a time scale of maybe a couple of hundred years. And so we have to make the most of this opportunity and not blow it. So I would draw the analogy to uh, a, a young children who are left an immense fortune by their uh, parents and grandparents and so on. And the challenge is, are you going to do something useful with that legacy or are you going to blow the inheritance, right? And so I think the role of semiconductors and, and smart technology is to use the most of this opportunity that we have to come up with scalable solutions on a societal scale and then ultimately transition to uh, other forms of high density energy that are gonna meet the societal needs of billions of people. And that is really the overarching challenge that engineers have to be part of the, the con contribution to that solution. And, and I think the framing of engineering uh, 50 years from now in the, 70, uh, seven, in the uh, 2070s is a great way to think about it because I think this is such an immense challenge that the time scale for solving this problem is actually 
50 to 100 years using all the smart technologies that we have today. Excellent. Thank you. Bear, please go ahead. So this has been um, somewhat imposing. I, I'm hearing these people talk about these wonderful technologies. Um, and I guess I may take on the role of the Lorax, who speaks for some other group. Uh, and, I, and I'm forced to remember that as an industrial engineer, we're always asking, what's the objective function? What are you trying to make increase or decrease? And what we also find out when we ask our clients about that is that there's rarely universal agreement on what the objective function is. Uh, since we're talking about semiconductors, I read an interesting story about the history of Purdue, that at one point they were, we were, the world leaders in developing these sorts of silicon transmission. But they had an objective function of minimizing the impurities in the substrate. That, unfortunately, was the wrong call. That influenced whether or not Intel existed, whether or not Texas Instruments existed in years to come. So trying to understand what is the objective function, I think, is a really crucial element. I, I, I think of myself as a romantic idealist, but not necessarily an optimist. And the reason why is, Civilizations have known structured, coordinated irrigation for thousands of years. And hundreds of millions of people are still without reliable food, fresh water, and power. We have been able to understand the concept of um, sharing resources. We have also understood the concept of trying to control resources. It has not been clear that the expectation of all of us in this room, let alone all of us in this county, believe that sharing resources, especially scarce resources, or resources we believe to be scarce, is the right thing to do. And so we have to ask, what does that mean for the use of these technologies in, in the future? We have to think about, rather than maintaining a particular solution, how do we design for the widest possible range of solutions? So I, I, I read Wired Magazine, and they have those six-word um, contest at the end. I was a creative writing minor in college, so, so I do this. Um, and I was thinking about from, you know, some of the semiconductor uh, work and, and some of the photonics work uh, that um, our, our colleague was talking about. And what happens with the headline, Zero Dopa Hack Suspected in Killings comma, suicides. In other words, the direct brain interface, the intersection of neurons and photonics, allows someone to upset the chemical balance of thousands of people who have relied on that technology to manage bipolar disorder. To say, well, you can't do that, or you wouldn't do that. People have been hacking Fitbits and defibrillators and infusion pumps. Why would you want to do that? That's a question for a different social scientist, I think. <laughs> but I don't think that we can assume that just more and better engineering will give us a different species of human. Well, thank you. I think this is an exciting topic further to. So let us take this theme of uh, conversation further along. So if you look at where the discipline of engineering came, somewhere in about 1700, 
a formal first college of engineering was established in France and then first came in the United States in West Point. And over the time, the College of Engineering progressed. But if you look back, what people call Industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, mechanization, electrification, then electronicification or computerization, and now datafication, you can literally trace the origin of all the way from agriculture engineering to civil to mechanical to electrical to electronics and industrial and chemical. All the, you can, literally you can progress that. So the growth of engineering, as I see, was driven by how, as a society, we progressed through those modern industrial revolutions, if I may call. But now we are at a point in history that we are solving problems, not just for civil infrastructure, not only for electrification like Edison and others we are doing. We are solving far bigger problems. We are solving problems that how we are going to feed the growing population that is expected by 2050, somewhere close to 9 billion. There would be a little over 2 billion people, or maybe a little less than 2 billion people now than we will have in that time. How we can get medical care to all of them? So with that kind of, we, are, we have different problems now. That gave the birth to the disciplines of engineering and what we call schools or departments today. We build those in the serial processing, but now we are going in serious parallel processing. And I, I have a question for my panel is that in 2070, do you think this infrastructure that we have built of disciplines, those are verticals, if I may call, somewhat partitioned, their, their walls are coming down slowly and steadily, but will these institutions, the way they are, will they be or they will look something very morphed into something different, proportional to the problems of the magnitude we are solving. Because the problems we are now solving and will be solving, those are very different magnitude problems. And I would love to hear your thoughts that how engineering discipline education infrastructure could and may look like by then. With that, Sasha, go ahead, please. Um, certainly, there will be evolution, and if there is no evolution, it's uh, stagnated. It means there is no progress. And we have already witnessed, um, for example, the formation of electrical and computer engineering, right? So with the rise of uh, semiconductor industry, we already were in a situation where we had to create new programs and uh, train the workforce for never existing industry. That happened already once. Um, right now, it is happening again. It is happening again with AI and uh, um, quantum science and technologies. What's interesting about quantum that I am I'm part of, um, and I'm actually also workforce uh, lead for uh, the DOE-funded Quantum Science Center, um, I know that there is a gap uh, we do not have a workforce um, for quantum scientists and engineers. And we will have to create this workforce. And we will have to ask ourselves what other skills that we would need to build the next generation of devices that will have to address a multitude of questions that you mentioned. So training for an engineer that will be designing unhackable, secure quantum systems, they have to keep in mind cyber wars in mind, not just the technical aspect of it. If we are designing a sensor, we have to think about uh, space exploration. We have to think about renewable energy. And this will be a motif that we'll have to reflect in creating new curricular and new education programs. How the future engineering would look like depends on where we are going, where the whole field of engineering is going, and obviously renewable energy uh, renewable and sustainable agriculture, clean water, um, food, security, uh, those items that are driving us. And that 
what we will drive um, the education and uh, workforce development in the future. Thank you. Let me just add to that. I, you know, I, I agree with what you've said. Um, and I, I, I was struck by a comment that Barrett made about social scientists. You know, I, I don't think there's particularly anything necessarily wrong with the engineering disciplines as we know them, with the one exception that we, set, we do serve a societal purpose. Every product that we deploy should serve a societal purpose. And yet, we never have input from social scientists. We just don't. I was really encouraged in, when President Biden announced his, the membership of his Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, because for the first time in the history of the United States, a social scientist, Alondra Nelson, was appointed to OSTP. That is, you know, it got some attention, but it, not nearly as much attention as it should. That is a landmark decision by a president of the United States. And uh, she is today serving as the director of that office. Now, why is that important? Because we, engineers, we take what scientists learn about nature, we make it useful, and we make it available to the public, to, the, to society in some hopefully useful form. But we never ask society to weigh in on any of this. They just don't. They may weigh in by deciding whether they buy it or not. You know, will you buy this product or not? But would it not be interesting to get a societal view, for example, on whether we should be using, going forward, the next 50 years, we should be using fossil fuels for the next 50 years, or whether we should look at renewables or hydrogen or some other energy source? Would it not be useful to find out what society thinks about that? Now, you know, you, people will say, well, they're not engineers, they're not scientists. What do they know? The fact is they live on this planet. And they should have a right and a voice to some expression of either concern or approval or involvement. And I think, I, frankly, I think we do a very poor job, technologists, we, <laughs> collectively. We do a poor job of engaging the public. And yet we're serving them. That's our point. That's the whole, whole point of engineering, to, to develop systems that serve a societal purpose. So I like this. I like the social science that comes from this guy, I really do. We, we had dinner last night. I, I'll tell you, this is a little bit staged because we did have dinner together last night. And I, and I was struck by, I didn't realize that this industrial engineer also had a social science background. This is pretty impressive. He's, a, he's way ahead of his time, let me tell you. <laughs> well, thank you, Ron. Uh, Sang, yes. please. So, um, you know, one thing I always uh, remind myself is if you watch the science fiction movies from the 1950s and what they thought the year 2000 would be like. <laughs> yeah. There are two things about those movies that strike us now looking back as kind of humorous. One is flying cars, right? The regular automobiles that everyone saw in the streets in the 50s yeah. would be replaced by flying cars. Yeah. And of course there's interstellar travel and space flight and so on. But if you look at the controls of those uh, uh, aircraft, uh, uh, vehicles, uh, there's no sign of semiconductors or digital technologies. It's what they know, which is anal analog controls, but obviously on a bigger and flashier screens blinking and so on. And so that basically says you, your, our ability to project what's ahead 50 years uh, is limited by what we see and feel are important in the current context. And so I think uh, that aspect of human nature is very hard to overcome. So with that in mind, to check my hubris, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a few bets, which is, you know, one the bet you can definitely make is the tight correlation between the standard of living and, and, and our advancement of our civilization and energy utilization. And, and it's very clear, obviously, uh, fossil fuels, for example, is a depleting resource. And so if we want to have advances and progress, we are going to have to find new sources of energy that can meet the, the needs of, of the, you know, the billions of people on this planet. That's one thing. And I, I, don't, I don't see that changing unless there's something so unexpected, a breakthrough in human nature that that correlation between energy usage 
and civilization is decoupled. You know, if that happens, then of course all bets are off. But at this point, I don't see how that could possibly happen. So I think that's something that uh, obviously engineers will be very active in delivering that uh, energy. And I, and I think the, 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 the second thing is just like the semiconductor revolution caught the science fiction uh, futurist by surprise and, and there were no flying cars, I think the way this, um, this, these challenges are overcome are going to come from unexpected sources. That It's not just a projection of what we know today, but possibly unexpected breakthroughs in science and materials engineering and so on that give us new ways to address problems that today we cannot even imagine. So a breakthrough that makes nuclear energy safe, for example, or a breakthrough in fusion energy where after many, many decades of frustration, but finally, you know, something happens and fusion suddenly becomes feasible. It's that kind of transformation that makes the future very different from the science fiction prediction that we have today. Well, you know, you know I have to make a comment. This is, when I, when I was a kid, do you, remember, do you ever remember Dick Tracy comic? Yeah. yeah. When I was a kid, I remember seeing Dick Tracy in his wrist radio. Remember that? When, yeah. If you ever read it. Yep. And I, and I was a kid, I was thinking, oh, man, that guy's got an imagination. That'll never happen. And I have an eye watch that does exactly what Tracy was thinking and many more things. It's the unexpected nature of what we're dealing with. Some of these things you cannot even imagine. And yet, in 50 years, I think we'll look back, some of you will look back and say, my God, that was, where did that come from? How did, how did a guy like, um, who was the, who was the, cartoonist, Chester Gould, I think, the uh, cartoonist who drew Dick Ch How did he imagine a wristwatch, a wristwatch serving as a radio and a later on a wrist TV? This was in the, in the 40s, I think, somewhere way back. I wasn't a kid in the 40s. I was, that was a little earlier, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, these are things you can't even imagine. And yet, they will happen, and we have to respond accordingly. But I think, you know, it, when I think back to the wrist to the wristwatch and, and Dick Tracy, it, it wasn't a technologist who conceived of the idea. I think Apple acted on it, but it was it was Diet Smith. That's who it was. Diet Smith. No, it was the son of Diet Smith in Dick Tracy who invented the wrist radio. That tells you something about my cartoon interest. But <laughs> so much for that. No, well, thanks, Ron, for bringing that. One, after we hear our colleague, we're going to go back to our colleagues in the audience yeah. to s request some questions. So keep thinking, but we'll come back to you just in a minute. Go ahead, Bear. Uh, recognizing that we do want the voice of, of society here. What we're hearing, though, um, from, from your point, Ron, is that it's not technologists that drive these things. They respond to imagination. And one of, the, one of the things that we see is that with all the growth in uh, our information systems, the materials genome initiative that you're describing won't work in a text-based organizational system. You need something else. You're right. And so being able to imagine beyond the boundaries of what we've come to recognize is really important. Most engineers are specialists. That's why we have the specialties that we do have. So, um, do we have a question from the audience? Yeah. Uh, go ahead if there is a question. But before you go, I really hope, Ron, that materials genome can yield vibranium. <laughs> because I'm looking for this vibranium from Wakanda. Oh. That can do a lot of magic. But, <laughs> but uh, we are on a too lighter note here. So, go ahead, please. Question. Uh, uh, please tell your name, which school you come from, and your question. Yeah, uh, my name is Blake. I'm an industrial engineer. Um, my question is related to what Professor Caldwell said, but for everyone and addressing truly global issues, not even necessarily a population's demands or needs, but as humanity as a whole, how has slash will markets and profit influenced how we do those engineering and what problems we solve? Uh, any of my colleagues would like to address? Do you have a question for a specific colleague of mine or? For, uh, anybody would like to? Just ask a, a clarification. Can you give me a concrete? Could you raise your mic? Yeah. 
Of course. Uh, oh, the one I guess most people would point to, the easiest top of my head, would be uh, you know the the patenting of you know antibiotics, things like this. That you know what makes money and what is viable and what looks good, whatever you know the metric might be, and what is objectively good for people are not always lined up. And we've used that metric lockstep for so long. I'm wondering how that relationship will look in the future. Let me let me take a crack at that. You know, let me say first, I'm a capitalist. I, I certainly believe that people who develop things that are useful and effective and responsible for societal means, I think they deserve to, to earn whatever they can from that. So, I, you know, um, I, you know, I think we have, to, but I think we do have to look at the societal benefits and weigh that against the motive to make profit without being responsible. It, it's very easy to say, well, I, I can build a system, I know how to do it, I know how to market it, but the, the real question should be, does it really serve society? And I know that's a tough, that last one can, you know, if you, if you think you can get rich making something, you, you're likely to do it. But I always think of the, you know, the old joke about, or the hom homely comment about better mousetrap. If it's something that really improves the quality of life, do it. That's my attitude. Well, thank you, Ron. Are there any other questions? Well, if, if my colleagues and audience are quiet, let me go through some fast. Oh, please go ahead. This is about predicting the future. Uh, uh, if you look at, uh, this is an article Freeman Dyson wrote some years ago on tool-driven revolutions versus concept-driven revolutions in physics. Uh, there are a number of the concept-driven revolutions are things like relativity, quantum mechanics, uh, Newton's laws, etc. They yeah. come few and far between. Tool-driven revolutions are come from a new tool which occurs fairly frequently, like the atomic force microscope or Fourier analysis or things of that nature. It I'm, may I'm be wondering if your microphone is turned on. I'm not sure. Okay, I think. Um, uh, I, I think everybody heard what I said, so I think it seems like in terms of predicting the future, predicting tool-driven revolutions may be more easy. Uh, predicting concept-driven revolutions is like predicting singularities and catastrophes. Yeah. That I find difficult to imagine we'd be able to, to predict. I mean, nobody predicted the internet. Yeah. So, you know, any thoughts on the it's not a really a question as a comment, and I would like to hear each of your comments on it. Maybe starting Anyone? with Professor yeah. Bartosz. Well. Yes, ahead, I can sorry. start. You see that I was like, I was ready <laughs> to, jump, <laughs> to jump in. Uh, well, first of all, I don't believe in tool revolution. I am an engineer, but all tool revolution start with a concept revolution. And I am a believer that for whatever advances to happen in technology, it has to be truly creative breakthrough in fundamental science. That's why advances and breakthroughs in fundamental science are crucial. They are the driver of our society, and that's why it's hard to predict. And let me remind you the discovery of a laser. When laser was invented, people didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> yep. It was a solution looking for a problem. Can you imagine a world without a laser and optical fiber communication systems right now? No. It was ahead of time. But without the laser or without the semiconductor um, discoveries, we would not be where we are. The same is with, with quantum. First, were very fundamental discoveries of quantum states and quantum mechanical nature and laws. And then we come up with ideas. And I do believe that more breakthroughs are to happen. And whether that would be human creativity alone or working together with AI, I know you didn't mention it already, that's something for us to see. Well, excellent comment. We are last five minutes. Thank you for your pointers. I appreciate that. So in close session like this is very difficult to summarize, I must tell you. 
So in summary, what I'm going to ask the following question, and I would request a reasonably quick response, if I may say. And the question is, if you had to write and lock one engineering idea and a piece of advice to your peers in a time capsule, now imagine a time capsule, something like what we have, we could, that would open in 2070 what that one idea and one advice could be. And with that, Sasha, if I may start with you. I know this one, yeah. one thought and one, one advice yes. and one idea. One advice, um, the sky is the limit. Keep creating with a human being and planet in mind. I'm gonna use this opportunity also to uh, provide yet another answer to Blake's question of market failures, which is, uh, we have a situation where the market incentives are not aligned with protecting people in vulnerable areas, for example, like Southern Africa, where you could have enormous numbers of people who are not protected who are infected simultaneously by multiple viruses. And so it's clear, for example, that uh, virus uh, variants like Omicron are hybrids that originated when people are infected by more than one virus and so on. So in that time capsule, I'll say, we apologize for missing this threat to humanity that killed 99% of the people on the planet. <laughs> and so when you open this capsule uh, seven years from now, we apologize. Thank you. Go ahead, Ron. Well, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned hydrogen earlier today. And I really do look, 50 years forward, I really do look to a planet where hydrogen is the energy medium. It has all of the right attributes. And I, I don't mean to try to sell hydrogen, but it's not geopolitical. It, it's water and sunlight. If you find the right material to split water, you can produce hydrogen and you can use it as a fuel. I, I really do hope the planet is at that, at that stage in 2070. Well, excellent. Go ahead, Barry. I, I have to build on the last two comments. And you stole my idea about the, the we're sorry. Um, <laughs> And, and my version of we're sorry is, we thought that scarcity and competition were all that we could do. And before we get to the hydrogen economy, I will remind you how flammable hydrogen is. Oh. <laughs> but hey, let me, let me answer. You know, methane is flammable, but we use it for cooking and heating. And it's, it's engineering, folks. We have to manage risks, and we can do it. So I have now I have two responsibilities, one to tell idea and a thought, but before that I want to do something more important. I first want to thank Dean Mengchen, Professor Arvind Raman, Professor Mark Lernstrom, and all the staff that have worked tirelessly to make this possible. Let's give them a round of applause to bring all the resources. I also want to uh, share now, I believe, I have watched Matrix movie too many times. <laughs> and I believe that I would love to learn a topic, so many topics that I believe that I don't have enough hours in a day to learn more things. I believe that we can find an instrument that I can learn fast to fly and to do other things that I would. So a device like this in 2070. But I think the thought that I would only share that what matters at the end of the day is what you're happy about. And that I do not believe would change in 2070 as a human. So with that note, I wish you all the best. I once again would like to thank my colleague. And ideas like this inspire more of these. So we look forward to see more of these. So with that, have a great end of the semester and a great summer. Thank you for attending. Have a good afternoon.